In 1967, Brazil drew a plan to become more militarily self-sustaining. The flow of U.S. material had decreased because of its entanglement in the Vietnam War, and after a study, Brazil recognized external dependence on arms supplier as a serious problem for its political position in South America. The plan to solve this would be the start of the Brazilian defense industry. The first steps were small but would lead to Brazil's very first wheeled reconnaissance vehicle with production in mind, designated VBB-1. The VBB-1 kick-started the development of wheeled armored vehicles in Brazil, with the EE-9 Cascavel being the most successful result. The EE-9 itself also went through some design stages before it would become the Cascavel we know today. But nevertheless, the 37mm arm EE-9 M1 was the foundation of Brazil's most successful armored fighting vehicle. Hello and welcome to another Tang Encyclopedia voiced article. I'm your host Tony and today I'll be covering the EE-9 M1. If you like our videos and want to support us, please consider donating on Patreon or Paypal. All of the funds will be used to improve future Tang Encyclopedia content. Any help would be greatly appreciated. The story of why the EE-9 Cascavel, a rattlesnake, was developed can be traced back to the Second World War. Brazil sent an expeditionary force known as the Smoking Snakes to fight in Italy alongside the Allies. The M8 Greyhound would turn into the most loved vehicle by the Brazilian soldiers, which would make it the most impactful vehicle for the Brazilian development of armored vehicles. Before we go further, we would like to mention that this video will briefly touch upon most of the designs heading towards the EE-9 M1 Cascavel. In total, from mock-up to EE-9 M1, Brazil had designed 9 different turrets and 5 different hulls. As such, the author would like you to check out the article on the website for a better representation of all these design steps and their context. In addition, we will only focus on the EE-9 armed with a 37mm gun in this video, except for a few minor tangents. Again, the influence between the 37mm and the 90mm Cascavel is better described in the article for which you can find in the link in the description. With the decreased flow of US material and the subsequent study which proposed the extensive adoption of wheeled armored vehicles, Brazil got to work from 1968 on. From this point onward, the PQRMM-2 or Regional Motor Mechanization Park of the 2nd Military Region would start taking the first steps toward developing armored vehicle for the army. After remotorizing a range of vehicles to gain experience, the team developed the previously mentioned 4x4 VBB-1. From there, the team continued to develop 6x6 vehicle as the army did not want a 4x4. The first mock-up of what would become the EE-9 Cascavel was built in early 1970 and was designated as the VBR-2. The VBR-2 was pretty much a simplified Brazilian copy of the M8 Greyhound, armed with a 37mm cannon and sharing many design aspects with the M8. The Greyhound-style turret of the previously designed VBB-1 was also mounted on the VBR. It is important to mention that the VBR-2 did not yet have the classic boomerang suspension which would become the hallmark of Brazilian wheeled vehicles. This honor was bestowed on the CRR, which was the first prototype towards a Cascavel. The CRR was a more economically shaped VBR-2, which introduced the Angesa boomerang suspension. With this suspension, the CRR and future Cascavel would traverse otherwise untraversable hills for conventional suspension systems, as the wheels would always stay in contact with the ground to provide maximum traction. Nearing the end of the construction of the CRR prototype, a new turret was designed based on the VBB-1 turret by adding a turret puzzle. This turret was a stopgap until a redesigned M3 Stewart turret was built. The CRR was extensively tested by the Brazilian army. During the trials, the CRR traveled over 65,000 kilometers and performed various mobility tests. A contract for the production of eight pre-series vehicles for the Brazilian Army was signed with Angesa in June 1971, and production commenced in 1972 and continued until 1975. With the signing of this contract, the CRR was officially carried over to Angesa and seems to have been marketed under the EE-9 Cascavel name from this point onward. The EE stood for Engineiros Especializados, the actual name behind the Angesa acronym. The 9 stood for its 9-ton weight and it was named after the rattlesnake or in Portuguese cascavel. It is good to mention that every cascavel after the EE-9 M1 was heavier than 9 tons. 
With the start of the pre-production came the topic of armament. It is weird that an armored car would use a World War II 37mm cannon in the 1970s, but where did this actually come from? A specification for reconnaissance vehicles was released in 1967, calling for a vehicle which could penetrate its own armor at ranges up to 1000 meters. The issue with this requirement is that practically every gun of 20mm and higher would be more than able to do so. By the end of 1972, the Brazilian army had selected two ranges of potential cannons, 20-40mm to or the 90mm. The 90mm would perform best for anti-tank mission, while the 20-40mm to range would be more fit for an infantry fighting vehicle role. The 20 and 40 mm were disregarded since the recon vehicle would not have the armor to perform the IFV role. It would take up to the second half of the 1970s for the Brazilian army to completely make up its mind on which cannons should be used on the cascavel, as they still ordered the 37 mm cascavel when the 90 mm was already in production for export. Another matter was armoring the cascavel. After having done some tests, the PQRMM-2 engineers discovered that an armor plate with a high hardness of 700 Brunel to blunt the bullets on the outside and a low hardness of 250 Brunel on the inside to prevent spalling would give significant advantages over homogeneous steel. The bimetal plates provided about 1.8 times the effective protection against 7.62 rounds and 1.5 times against 50 cal machine gun fire. The improved effectiveness meant that less armor could be used and thus the vehicle would be lighter. In early 1973, Angesa trialed their vehicle in Portugal. At the time, Portugal was embroiled in the War of Ultramar. No, not that Ultramar. And already operated the ML-90 and the Panard EBR. The Portuguese were impressed by the EE-9 Cascavel, but suggested that Angesa should arm the Cascavel with the same turret and gun as the AML-90 and return. The Portuguese trial set the Cascavel on course to become Brazil's most successful wheeled AFV, but that story is for another video as the EE9M2 was born at that moment. The CRR hull would get a few designs with the 90mm in the form of the HS90 turret, which was the AML90 turret, and a 90mm gun mounted in the redesigned VBB1 turret. As a brief tangent, at some point, there seems to have been a competition for a future 90mm and 37mm armed national turret design for the Cascavel between Bernardini, who built the X1 tank, and Angesa. No winner seems to have come from this competition, but a Bernardini designed 37mm armed turret was mounted on a CRM hull. By September 1975, the production of the pre-series of 8 vehicles, now known as the CRM, was finished. The CRM still carried over much of the design of the CRR hulls, but can be distinguished by the antenna which was moved from the left rear of the hull to the turret and the redesigned headlight guard. When the CRM was delivered, it seems that the plan altered M3 Stewart copy turrets were still not finished. As a result, the CRM received a more modernized version of the CRR turret. The new turret incorporated a ventilation inlet and the new antenna. The turret structure also incorporated a new design for sights for the commander and gunner. The eight vehicles were tested by the army not too long after delivery. The vehicles had to drive back and forth for 32,000 kilometers from Sao Paulo to Alegrete. The CRMs drove 24-7 and only stopped for fuel and maintenance. The CRM seemed to have performed well during these trials as the CRM and thus the EE-9 Cascavel was accepted into service. 102 production vehicles were ordered by the Brazilian army, all armed with a 37mm gun. If these 102 vehicles were actually delivered is unclear. Pictures exist where at least 9 production vehicles known as the EE9M1 Cascavel are shown. If these EE9M1s ever were delivered to army unit and to which is unknown. Some sources suggest that up to 50 M1s were built, but they are very vague about this number. According to statements from ex Angesa employees, the order seems to have eventually been converted into an order for the Cascavel M2, and the EE9 M1s were supposedly converted to M2s. It is estimated that the Brazilian army changed the order around 1976 to 1977. The production model differed from the CRM in a couple ways. The most notable differences were the copied and redesigned M3 Stewart turrets, which were finally delivered and the removal of the raised driver structure on the hull. Another very important change was the slanting of the rear hull. 
This was done to fix the issue of the turret bustle colliding with the engine bay covers, which enabled the usage of low-profile turrets. It is thought that the mounting of the HS-90 turret for Portugal initiated the redesign of the hull. Another change was the removal of the exhaust pipe on the right rear side of the hull. The EE-9M1 was unofficially called a cascafel magro, meaning skinny rattlesnake, while the 90mm armed cascafels were unofficially known as the cascafel gordo, meaning fat rattlesnake. The EE-9M1 weighed about 9 to 9.5 ton. It was about 5 meters long, 2.3 meters wide, and had a height of around 2.3 meters. The EE-9 had a three-man crew consisting of the commander slash loader on the left of the turret, gunner on the right of the turret, and driver in the middle of the front hull. The front upper hull plate presented 16mm of bimetal armor at 60 degrees. The sides and rear were 8.5mm thick, and the top and hull bottom were 6.5mm thick. The armor of the turret is unknown. Considering it was a copy of the M3 turret, the protection levels might have been similar. The vehicle used a 37mm M6 cannon as main armament, a coaxial 7.62mm machine gun, and a turret top mounted 50 cal machine gun. The exact engine of the EE9M1 for the Brazilian army is unknown. There is a range of potential engines which could have been used which include a Perkins, a Chrysler, and two Mercedes engine. Of these four engines, the most likely candidates are the Perkins 6357 and the Mercedes OM352 engines. Sadly, a definitive answer cannot be given at present as the Perkins was the only engine of the two to be mentioned in the early brochure, while the OM352 was the engine which the Brazilian army would eventually use in the form of the turbocharged OM352A. The M1 Cascapel had a top speed of 95 km per hour and an operational range of 700 km. The EE9M1 seems to have been more of a stopgap than anything else. Although the Brazilian army wanted the EE9M1, debates within the army were already heading towards either an autocannon or a 90mm cannon armed cascabel. It was at least quite clear from the start that the rest of the world wanted the 90mm. Considering the EE9M2 was already ordered by Libya in 1974, the M1 was already outdated before it was even put into production for the Brazilian army. As such, the EE9M1 itself was an excellent platform with an outdated turret. The Portuguese recognized the capabilities of the EE9 and were the ones who gave the nudge to Engesa to go forward and arm it with a 90mm. The Brazilians had succeeded in building their improved version of the M8 Greyhound and established the groundwork for what would become Brazil's most produced armored fighting vehicle of all time. This concludes our analysis of the EE9M1 Cascapel. If you like our videos and want to support us, please consider donating on our Patreon or PayPal. All of the funds will be used to improve Feature Tank Encyclopedia content. Until then, keep us in your sights.